Well, welcome to C2G Talk, a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews with influential practitioners and thought leaders to explore the governance challenges raised by emerging approaches to alter the climate. I'm Mark Turner, C2G's Director of Communications, and I'm speaking today with Ambassador Liz Thompson, who is the permanent representative of Barbados to the United Nations. Ambassador Thompson has worked in development policy for nearly 25 years and has served many professional roles, including as an elected member of parliament from 1994 to 2008, and at various times as the Minister of Energy and Environment, Housing and Lands, Physical Development and Planning and Health. From 2010 to 2012, she served as Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, with specific responsibility as one of two executive coordinators of the Rio Plus 20 Conference on Sustainable Development. Thereafter, she was engaged in a number of advisory roles within the UN system, including on the transition from the Millennium Development uh, goals to the Sustainable Development Goals in the Office of the UN Secretary General, UNDP, the President of the General Assembly, and on the Secretary General's Global Energy Initiative, Sustainable Energy for All. Welcome to C2G Talk, Ambassador Thompson. Thank you so much. I'm here fidgeting with my camera, but great to be with <laughs> you. So the world has not been acting fast enough to address multiple interlinked crises, including climate, biodiversity, sustainable development in general. You held a very senior position in the UN supporting the development of the Sustainable Development Goals and have represented the interests of island nations as part of your uh, ambassadorship. From your perspective and that of islanders, what is the severity of the moment we face now? Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, we have so often those of us engaged in the practice of environmental protection and environmental policy, spoken in terms of doom and gloom and framed what is happening as a crisis that I don't know if people listen to us anymore because for crisis to impact people or to make it into this, their psyche, they think of something that has immediacy. And for a lot of people, they don't see the problem as an immediate one. You know, they get up every day, the bus or the train is running, food is coming to their table, etc. Uh, so that when we say that uh, millions of species are being lost and that this is impacting on, on the earth generally and our quality of life ultimately because there is a chain reaction. It doesn't necessarily resonate. When we say that um, extreme weather events have increased, both in number and intensity, and that this has been the year of the worst fires on our planet ever. And simultaneously, it has been the most active hurricane season recorded. It doesn't necessarily resonate. And sometimes it has to do with the fact, if as an island person, there is a hurricane in Barbados or mm -hmm. the Caribbean, it affects everybody, the entire population. Whereas um, Hurricane Katrina, devastating as it was, and uh, Tropical storm, uh, so storm Sandy, devastating as it was, didn't impact everybody. The rest of the country went on unaffected, so that there are scales of crisis and perceptions of crisis and uh, attitudes to crisis that right. really impact what is happening right now. But there are multiple crises that are impacting people all over the world at mm -hmm. various levels in various ways for which we absolutely need uh, cohesive action and uh, coordinated policy intervention uh, and action. Right. And it is fascinating, actually, the way uh, you raise this issue of doom and gloom versus yeah. the tough reality. And I'd love to dig into that a, a little bit more later, because I know you've uh, you've written and talked about these issues before. So but but maybe if we begin with um, 
the actual sort of specific uh, impacts we might be seeing uh, in your region at the moment. And in terms of, uh, aside from maybe the public perception, how, how you see this moment that we're at, to what extent are we starting to approach tipping points and uh, of no return potentially? Well, I think the, the issue of tipping points is, is one really uh, for the scientists. They've indicated that we have roughly a window of 10 to 12 years to address these issues. In the Caribbean, it, it's, it's a very real problem. It has to do with, as I was indicating just now, the increase of uh, extreme weather events. The number of, I mean, Dominica uh, two years ago with um, Hurricane uh, Maria had 250% of its GDP wiped out in the face, in the place of a few hours. Right. How, how does a country come back from that? Um, the island of Barbuda, the entire population, the entire population, let me, and I repeat it deliberately, had to have, had to have been relocated. Uh, these are devastating impacts socially, economically, culturally, and in terms of the individual quality of life, sense of self and security. I mean, people lose everything. I remember uh, after the storm hit reaching out to a Barbadian who was living in one of the impacted islands and he is a young person, recently married, uh, professional, doing very well. And his response was, we lost everything. But thank God we are alive and we still have each other. So that there, there are the devastating extreme impacts. And then there is the incremental creep that also has significant impact. Uh, ocean warming which affects the habitats and species of uh, the habitats of marine species that then impacts the life of fishers and fisher folk. Coastal inundation, coastal damage, beach erosion and beach loss, which inv uh, impacts uh, tourism earning economies, increased dryness, uh, aridity, uh, impacts on the soils, which affects your capacity to grow food and become food, food secure, uh, to feed your populations. So you become even more dependent on imports, which you don't have resources for. It means a diversion of budgetary resources to deal in with climate impacts uh, when instead of putting that money into healthcare or education uh, or housing. So that in, in the Caribbean, in small island developing states, not just in the Caribbean, in the Indian Ocean, um, uh, in Africa, uh, in the Pacific, we are living the reality of climate change. There are islands, as I indicated earlier, that have had to have been abandoned because of, of uh, severe climate change impacts. So it is impacting our quality of life, our way of life, our culture, our societies, and our economies. But most significantly, it is impacting the future that we desire to have in an adverse way, I should say. Yes. So in terms of response, obviously, uh, the priority has been on cutting CO2 emissions, but there are also uh, additional approaches now being considered, such as large scale carbon dioxide removal, and uh, even potentially measures to reflect back uh, more sunlight known as solar radiation modification. These are some of the things we deal with uh, in our initiative. How ready do you see um, people around you, perhaps the global south in general, to consider some of these additional approaches? What level of information is there about some of these ideas? I would say that the level of information is low. But I think that because the problem is such an immediate and existential one for island peoples, that we certainly are willing to consider the use of tech, technological uh, 
interventions in grappling with the problem. The challenge is, are we going to be at the table when these uh, technology, new technologies are being considered? What will be the impacts on us? To what extent will we uh, be victims of the technology in the same way that we've been victims of climate change rather than having an opportunity to understand and to influence at the very early stages before there is complete rollout? To what extent uh, will there be ownership of these technologies by island people so that they can be appropriately adjusted or scaled for our particular considerations or so that the adverse impacts are not um, exacerbated in our own conditions and in our countries rather than our getting the benefit of the technology. So these are some of the, the questions and the concerns that would be immediately raised. On the other hand, as I pointed out, um, information level outside of the scientific communities is really quite low. And therefore, if people are unaware of a technology or don't fully appreciate how it is proposed to be deployed, what the options are, where they fit in, uh, what are the governance rules, whether how these rules impact them, then they're not in a position to understand, uh, to educate populations, to make informed choices, to consider the, the risks versus the benefits. Uh, so my concern is that there is a low information level, I would think, uh, even amongst policy mem uh, policymakers, or perhaps especially amongst policymakers who are going to be making the critical decisions and have to be at the table. But I know that at the level of the universities and the scientific community within the islands, that there is discussion and understanding of um, of these new technologies even if not complete engagement from those who are leading the discussions on the issues relative to the technologies. Well, you mentioned governance, and obviously that's a very broad process, which includes learning, discussing, taking decisions. What kind of um, frameworks do you think could be helpful to put in place uh, at the international or, or regional level to you know, discuss these technologies, help people learn about them, and then as potential decisions whether or not to deploy uh, come along to you know, maximize synergies and minimize trade-offs with the sustainable development goals? Well, I think that first of all, there has to be information. Uh, there has got to be a sense of inclusion, not just in the discussion, but um, benefits, risks, et cetera. There has to be some clear understanding and discussion about that. Uh, I think that there is going to, that people in the islands, however, are going to be perhaps a bit more skeptical about these kinds of large scale interventions, which are unprecedented and which we don't know the full consequences of, because clearly island peoples would not want to have their situations worsened by, by new technologies, which are intended to help, but ultimately which don't, or which have a long-term adverse impact. So I, I think that um, starting in inclusive discussions in the multilateral system within the context of the United Nations, uh, a set of regional conferences perhaps, so that a discussion, a, la a level of understanding and a level of interest is initiated, uh, then uh, we are more likely to have better responses rather than bring in uh, people in at the back end. And it isn't just governments to which I'm speaking, clearly civil society and populations have a significant interest in, in these outcomes and, and these approaches. So in terms of uh, involving civil society, uh, including the least powerful or the most vulnerable. How, how does that happen? How do people get involved in these discussions? As obviously the UN and the international system aspires uh, to inclusivity, but in practice it 
might not be so simple, what kind of things need to be done to help help this process? Well, the, the UN does have a civil society forum and there are powerful NGOs across the world. Uh, one can think of Oxfam uh, that has done a lot of work um, uh, that has done a lot of work on the SDGs and development generally. One can think of I, IUCN. Um, one can think of um, various uh, environmental bodies and, and NGOs. And I think that um, starting with information, uh, uh, at the level of these large NGOs and bringing them into the discussion. Because there are, let's face it, there are very powerful lobby groups and either uh, they are going to be able to bring uh, their influence in a positive way and embrace what is happening or they are going to be actively working against deployment of the technologies. And that sometimes comes from lack of understanding, from lack of inclusion in the discussion at the very early stages, or it may come from the fact that they are genuinely opposed because they don't see the benefit uh, or that they think that the risks outweigh the benefit. Uh, so uh, and trying to engage governments, trying to engage civil society, uh, having discussions with populations through the, the NGO community and civil society, I think certainly is a way to start that global interaction. Um, the UN is really yet to have any large meeting on, on this issue or uh, UNFCCC, for instance, is yet to have a large session uh, in a meeting, in a COP, maybe, uh, which includes a conversation about um, solar radiation management. And I think that until we start to have that kind of multilateral conversation, that um, interest is going to be kind of iffy. Uh, but this is something that may happen, may not happen, not sure where it is. Uh, it's not so important at the global level because I'm not seeing it on the UN uh, landscape, et cetera, right. et cetera. Uh, and that is perhaps uh, a concern in the approach at the moment. So how far away or close do you think we might be to that kind of conversation beginning? Mm, hard to say. <laughs> Truly, it's, it's hard to say um, because I think that right now there are some stakeholders who are very much engaged, but I don't know the extent to which they have been trying to create an ecosystem of conversation, of interest, of action, of activity around the technology, the possibilities, the options. So it's really very difficult to say how far away it is. Um, I think that interestingly enough, um, the change of government in the United States might tend to bring a higher level of moral suasion on the issue. And the announcement yesterday that um, former Senator John Kerry, uh, I think he may have been, um, very, who was a very senior person in either the Clinton or the Obama administration. I don't know which one, but the point is that President-elect Biden has actually identified an advisor or an ambassador on climate. This is a significant change. It means that the United States is going to come back to the table uh, relative to Paris, that it is going to treat climate issues with seriousness, that it is going to engage with climate science and climate scientists, and that these discussions, therefore, a technology that is based in science, a technology option that can beneficially impact populations who are uh, severely affected by climate change or mitigate or adapt or halt the worst impacts of climate change, that, that is a, a discussion uh, that is now far more likely to take place. And, and the engagement of the scientific community is critical to taking the process forward. So you mentioned the uh, 
change in the US. What other kind of things would make, I mean, drawing on your experience as a member of parliament and uh, someone who held multiple ministerial positions, what are the kind of things that would make politicians sit up and take notice about some of these uh, carbon dioxide removal approaches or SRM approaches? Is it um, science-based, but is it also issues around economic opportunities and uh, other potential challenges that emerge? What, what are the things that puts this into the political sphere out of the scientific sphere? Uh, it's it's interesting that you should frame it in that way because uh, I started with making the point that we've so often spoken about climate issues and environmental issues in the context of doom and gloom, but we've not spoken to them as opportunity, opportunity for an improved quality of life, opportunity for uh, change that benefits. Uh, uh, and is more inclusive for a larger number of people. Opportu economic opportunity, business investment opportunity, uh, investment in the future for young people and so on. So I, I think that this is an important lens through which we have to consider the climate issue. To what extent are opportunities, positive opportunities being created out of this crisis for us to have a more holistic approach to how we manage environmental issues versus social and economic issues or how we manage environmental issues as social and economic issues. Um, so that, that is an important uh, conversation that needs to take place. And I think if we frame it in that way, ministers of finance who, are, who tend to be the more powerful ministers in the cabinet are going to listen uh, more attentively. But uh, we must not um, underestimate the impact of the bully pulpit that the United States has and the moral leadership that they can bring to the issue. The fact that the U.S. seemed to have been throwing its hands up and, and dismissing uh, climate science. And, and you know, um, as I've heard uh, the former, the, the outgoing president say that, it, you know, it's a hoax by the Chinese. Um, when you have that kind of, of um, attitude, it has a spillover effect. If there is moral leadership, and an ethical leadership. And if leaders are saying, I am going to pay attention to the science, this is an issue that we need to address. Multilateralism is important. The United Nations is important. And I'm going to engage with the United Nations and other sovereign states in a sensible solutions-based manner that uses science as our platform. Then the rest of the world is going to pay attention. Uh, and so we look forward post January to, to having climate change addressed in a different way. At the same time, we have to concede that a lot of change has taken place at the level of communities, um, municipal, um, uh, municipal centers, mayoral uh, centers, et cetera, so that there has been engagement, even if not at the federal level, there is uh, engagement still going on at the community base level. And that, it, that too uh, is important, but we need the macro moral leadership on the issue. You yourself, I believe, experienced COVID-19. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the interface between science and policy. Do you think that the pandemic and what we've been through recently has either changed, well, your own thinking, but in general, the communities around you about the way science and policy interact? And does that have an effect on how we think about climate change? That's such an interesting but complex question. Um, there has been so much misinformation and disinformation about COVID that there are a lot of people who do not believe that COVID started as a result of a breach in nature. They think that it is a manufactured or man-made virus as opposed to a naturally occurring virus. And um, I, I ask people who say that, 
how then do you explain the plague and the Black Death? How then do you ex explain the uh, sp uh, Spanish flu? I think it was the, the last major pandemic of about 1918, 1919, 1920 in that area. Era. Uh, people can't answer. Um, they still tell you, but I feel, I, I, I still feel that it was manufactured. Um, I, I think that we are learning that we have to be more respectful of nature, that Mother Earth is called Mother Earth for a reason. And as her children, we must not be abusive of her. And we have to recognize that what we do to Mother Earth, we do to ourselves. Um, so, Getting that change of behavior, uh, that that recognition that planet, profit, and people don't have to be mutually exclusive, that we can work toward a people-centered planet that allows for profit um, without uh, abuses and exploitation. That is is really of extreme importance. Um, I think COVID has made us ask questions like, how can I live a better quality of life? Uh, all of the things that I was rushing around doing, how important are they really? What are my priorities? Uh, do I need to connect more with, with loved ones because life is so fragile? Um, I also has made us recognize that a lot of the faith, the absolute faith that we had in, in man-based systems and technologies is perhaps misplaced, that they are uh, not as infallible as, as we believed. You know, we've seen developed country um, healthcare systems completely overwhelmed and unable to cope. At the same time, uh, man's ability to innovate, to find uh, a vaccine in record time suggests that where we are willing to put effort, where we are willing to put emphasis, where we are willing to put resources, we are able to engineer solutions. And that is why what is happening in relation to, to climate change and the almost what could be described the, the, as uh, climate genocide, um, uh, 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 that is be per being perpetrated against uh, developing countries and islanders in particular. Um, that is what makes it such a tremendous tragedy, that it is avoidable, that there are solutions, that with effort, emphasis and resources, we could beat this if we wanted to. You raised so many things in that, in that answer. Uh, thank you. Um, maybe I could just grab two elements there. You talked about nature and technology, and that is it's just a fascinating relationship. And often um, when discussing some of these uh, new approaches, carbon dioxide removal or solar radiation modification, you get a sense that sometimes the discussion is actually as much about a fundamental attitude towards nature or technology as the tech, as, as the approaches themselves. Certainly in carbon dioxide removal, you get uh, a number of nature-based solutions, but also technological solutions. Do you think that um, people are heading towards a more, and, and, and then we take the word faith as well, but do you think people are heading towards more of a nature-focused uh, approach to these things? Or do you think that there will be a kind of a balance in how people understand uh, the relationship between nature and technology as we look for approaches to tackle this crisis? Actually, I think that there is going to be a balance. And I think that because of our young people, our young people grow up with technology at their fingertips, you know, from the time they're born, uh, they're engaging with the technology, they see it as a tool for problem solving for things that you do in, in your everyday life, for quality of life, for convenience, for connecting. So that uh, because our young people are invested in technology and because wherever you go, 
in whatever part of the world, there are so many young people who are engaged and passionate about the issue of climate and protecting the earth and, and being respectful of nature and consuming less resources. I mean, the whole thing of the sharing economy, which is being driven by, by young people, is, is less of a consumer economy than we are accustomed to, where we, we use uh, and then discard or or just invest in, in consumer goods all the time. Uh, so I think that because uh, we are seeing this, this dual interest in our young people, that there is likely to be a, a, a balanced approach, that uh, one that understands the uses of technology and is willing to deploy and engage it as necessary, but one which is also very respectful of the planet. And maybe just one question, I think it's never enough one question, but about faith. Some of the um, approaches uh, that are being discussed, for example, potential for stratospheric aerosol injection to reflect that sunlight, this starts to tread onto areas which some people describe as playing God or uh, you know, entering into areas where certainly humanity has not had quite the potential levers that it had uh, appears that it could have now. How important a role do you think faith and religion and uh, other ethical frameworks will have in helping people take these decisions? I think that people use faith in an obstructionist way. But I'm a Christian. The Bible tells us that we are made in God's image. And if that is true, then God makes us infinitely capable of engineering, of imagining, of innovating. And we, it, we, we have a responsibility to use those skills for good and for um, the, the benefit of the human family. And, and let's think about it. Really, we have been playing God for a very long time. Um, from the time we, we invented vaccines and stopped natural death and natural selection, we were playing God. We've been playing God every time we save a premature baby, which nobody says us uh, not to do. Everybody wants a premature baby saved and, and all of the risks that that baby might face in life eliminated. Uh, we've been playing God when we sent people uh, off to the moon and, and sent uh, um, an exploratory uh, spacecraft uh, to, to look at Mars. We've been playing God for a very long time and in very many ways, and we are going to continue to do so. And I don't know that it is wrong because if we are made in God's image and if we accept the, the infinite potential and capabilities that he, he places within us, uh, then we must also accept that there are places there to be used and to be used for the good of humanity and to be used for the good of the planet on which we live. There's uh, one phrase I was reminded of uh, that a famous futurologist Suggest we are as gods, now we have to get good at it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I like that, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, I wanted uh, to finish on almost where you began, on the issue of doom and gloom. And um, so we deal in climate with some really quite challenging issues in terms of uh, you know, how, how uh, we take them on emotionally. Um, at the same time, you clearly uh, have to keep on going. You know, I believe you wrote Barbados' first uh, audio book, Make Yourself Happy. Um, how do you maintain a sort of hopeful, happy approach to life, even at such a difficult moment in, in humanity's journey? So Make Yourself Happy was actually our second audio book. There was one previously, and I think it was on something to do with medicine or health. Um, you know, the thing is that we cannot remain depressed. Um, hope springs eternal in the breast of man. There, and, and that really is true, that ultimately we recognize that life is about getting on with the business of living, with the joy of living, with the connection of living. And, and therefore, even though there are crises, we also recognize that 
this is not, these are not, whether it's a crisis of COVID, whether it's a crisis of climate, these are not the first crises that the world has faced. We've had world wars, we have had pandemics, we have had um, physical uh, devastation, environmental devastation, um, but we have survived. We have managed to pull ourselves back from the brink of disaster. When, when we looked back on how war had hurt humanity, we formed the United Nations. When we looked at uh, how uh, we were, were having various challenges and problems that threatened our species, we found solutions and we will do so again. Man has ultimately found a way to survive and to succeed. And I think, you know, it goes back, uh, uh, though it will not be popular to say this in the multilateral context, and it is perhaps not politically correct. I think that the God in us really saves us and causes us to save others and to save our planet. So even when we become our worst selves, as we have seen with dictators over time, even when we have been destructive, someone, someone's humanity recognizes the value of our planet and the dignity of the human family, and we act to enhance and protect it. And this is what we're going to do now. This is what we absolutely have to do now. And I believe that we will. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. It's very interesting to talk with you. Uh, Ambassador Thompson, I really appreciate coming to, you coming to CTG Talk. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.